We ready to go? Okay. So I want to start off by saying the obvious, and that's that I'm excited to be here, and that, that I'm balancing right now uh, quite a bit of anxiety around that, and also a little bit of an eagerness that I can be done with mine, and then relax, and <laughs> you know, yeah. look at yours. And I know I've already gotten to know, and I'll get to know you all a little more personally over the next few days, but I want to take the kind of get to know me section and talk a little bit about some of the high points in my career, because I, I think that's kind of what has defined me. And it started uh, in college. I started a, a marine design and construction company. And that was really my first foray into complete entrepreneurship, really experimenting, getting uh, client management. And about the same time, I was also working for L3 Communications, designing RFID hardware for tracking IT assets. And that was the complete opposite side of the spectrum, where I really got exposed to bureaucracy, both with Vandenberg and working as part of a, a large company. And I then went ahead and got my professional engineer's license. And that was my probably most traditional period of my life where I worked with uh, designing Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and uh, did general commercial work, data centers, stuff that like engineers do. And, but at that same time, I landed a contract with uh, Bloom Energy, who at that time was a startup. They, they make fuel cells. And I really got to taste what it was like to be part of a startup. And even though I was an external contractor, that was a huge transformative experience for me. And that's one of my favorite pictures on the bottom. I got to sit next to like Schwarzenegger and Larry Page. And that was exciting. Um, I then started an energy division at my company. Um, and I, my big contract was working with Kaiser Permanente. I did, uh, ran their energy procurement program and had um, really was just completely immersed in finance, contracting, facility management, all these new things I'd never done before. And that was um, a very interesting time. And from that, I really started to specialize in energy economics. And I, I mean, I, I started Googling what net present value was on my phone the first day. Like, I knew nothing. But in the end of it, I was developing models that looked at uh, future performance of energy systems, time of use tariffs, and all these things. And I'm still very convinced that about 80% of energy projects have completely faulty economics. That's another presentation entirely. <laughs> and I also dabbled a little bit in research. I uh, worked with Israel-based Panoramic Power. And uh, we actually got a million dollar grant from the Bird Foundation to jointly develop their energy monitoring hardware. So that was also pretty fun. But after all of this, I was still very frustrated um, and a little bored. But frustrated because I, I really didn't like how business was done. Um, I felt that people in very high positions struggled with very simple um, decisions. And often when there was like math and math-like topics in there, people just blanked out. And that, that drove me nuts. And so my parents are both K-3 teachers, have been my whole life. And so I'd always thought like, oh, once I make my money, I'll be a teacher. Later in life, maybe I'll be a teacher. But at this point in my career, I actually just said, you know what? I need to think. Took a two-month sabbatical, um, tried to find a way to, uh, a free way to get into education. Found uh, Math for America, which kind of led me to hearing about High Tech High and from the moment I stepped foot in the first High Tech High building, I said, I'm going to work here. And if we fast forward a little bit to now, I've been at High Tech High for three years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the atmosphere, for those that aren't familiar with it, um, some realizations I've had there, a little bit about my program, and then how that looks through the lens of student work. So when you first walk into High Tech High, you notice the architecture, the glass, the high ceilings, the natural light. But if you sit for a minute and you look around, you start to notice the walls. There is student work everywhere. Design, art, engineering. But then once you settle in, you really notice that the student activity, the focus, the industry, the engagement. And you don't hear teachers. You don't hear bells. You hear students. And High Tech High is a K-12 um, school is going to show my classroom in a bit. That's my class. Um, it's a K through 12 charter system. Uh, we were actually founded on uh, the idea that we could create talent for the local tech industry. Um, that being said, uh, we are a self-titled liberal arts school. My classroom is a classroom with a couple power tools in the corner. I have computers that are five to six years old. I don't have a wood shop. I don't have a machine shop. So it is, it is not sometimes the tech people think it is, but it has continued to be um, a site of progressive education. And as I've been teaching there, I've realized some things. And you can probably completely understand all of this by just looking at it. But um, it's really kind of sadly representative of my daily thought process. 
and maybe that's just what teaching is. But uh, as I've gone through my first few years, I've started to distill a few things that are just continual thoughts. And I'm going to frame it through the lens of um, what an employer might ask. So if you had to decide between hiring one of two people, who would you choose? A, the person with perfect skills and qualifications but lacking grit, or B, the person with exceptional grit and lacking some of the other bits. So, B. <laughs> and the truth is that 98% of employers when surveyed choose B. And that may not be new news. You might say like, oh yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And this has been part of our cultural identity for as long as anyone can remember. And I think it's who we as Americans think we are. But I would argue that it's also who we're really trying to be. And um, academia has jumped on board. You see some names up here you probably recognize. And they all recognize the value of grit. But few people have really said, how do we improve that in students? What are the things we do to make that um, happen? And if we look to the world of business and behavioral psychology, authors like Paul Stoltz have been doing this in business for 25 years. This is not just a need of education. It is a need of life. And if we, if we look to them, there are some things we can distill. I've been lucky enough to work with Paul over these last few weeks, and I've distilled a few of his ideas that I think help make this kind of an achievable goal for us. And I've broken it down to four characteristics. And each of these is, I think, significant, but also separate and teachable. And I'm going to go through these quickly in the, for time. Growth mindset. Um, we can look the question. Has happened? Five minutes. Left? Okay. Um, wow. Um, <laughs> I believe that their abilities can be developed through dedication. I've only had to go on six and minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, the, the ability that you can really change, and I think without that, nothing else matters. And so we can really lean on Carol Dweck to improve that in kids. Also, resilience, and that's really just kind of your immediate response to adversity. How do you deal with it? Um, intensity and tenacity, really nose to the grindstone work ethic, and the ability to get back up when you're kind of put down. and. I ask you, how do we actually increase these in, in classrooms so that we can actually see these characteristics in our students? And I call it adversity by design. And the first thing you need to do is develop the need. And if you think about grit as an immune response to adversity, we need to have the adversity in order to develop that response. And so we have to design it in. Um, and I like to do it through product-focused projects. Minor all engineering, because that's what I'm interested in, but I think it could be done through anything. And as part of those, there needs to be a high perception of difficulty. Students need to think, oh, this isn't something students could normally do. This is really hard. And it also has to be skill-based. They have to come out with a tangible skill friends might not have, or something they can rely on in the future. And it's also where we have to be very careful about um, how we interact with students, because how they deal with that adversity on a day-to-day -day basis is what has the potential to rewire their brain, but it also has the potential, if we're not careful, to reinforce existing bad habits. So we have to be very conscious of how we do kind of the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, what you say to kids. Um, also, uh, in my case, I teach 14-year-olds, and adversity is by definition difficult. And um, they may not have the uh, emotional maturity or even cognitive ability yet to deal with this, so you have to be very careful. and really take the time to scaffold for each kid so you don't end up just burning them out. And that's where we get to project scaffolding, where we, we really do manage the adversity for every kid. We differentiate for every kid, because what's hard for one kid is not for another. Um, and how does this look through student work? When I, when I first started teaching, I kind of did the normal physics -y project. I built air cannons and Tesla coils and things like that. Okay, go, go. And then I started focusing on more comprehensive projects. And that we had a lot of trial and error and error and error. And then I really got to see, though, what it was like when a kid finished a project like that. And, and then I moved down to teach freshmen. And, uh, or after, this was actually one of the comprehensive projects where uh, it's called Senior Squared, and this toy was built and designed by a student for a senior citizen as part of a project we called Senior Squared. And then I moved down to freshman, and this is a project where, with the help of naval architects, we actually built, uh, designed from scratch, and built boat holes and had them thermal formed at a, a parent's factory. Did all the electronics, basically made custom RC boats. 
And um, this was part of a joint humanities project where they actually studied piracy in all of its forms. And our project actually culminated in a merchants versus pirates naval battle, which is kind of fun. And then, um, what I one of my favorite projects, we had students study Maya, Greece, Easter Island, and we found civilizations that have, have risen and fallen, and students had to figure out what is a common thread, and they had to theorize on what that is. They then had to take their social theory and manifest it in a mechanical way. And so we went through paper and iteration after iteration after iteration into wood and um, finally into our final materials resulting in our um, exhibited project which is a little over 250 foot pounds and about 8 foot by 8 foot. This is the apocalypto. That's the apocalypto project. Yeah. And part of that, and I've got four minutes so I'm going to go fast. Um, as you can imagine, students aren't the only ones that are challenged by this. Uh, this is very uh, challenging to me as well. And I'm going to get off my soapbox for a second and just say that uh, I have to completely own the fact I'm a new teacher. I am a couple years in. My pedagogy is like any new teacher's. And I am throwing hours at it right now. But there are a lot of things I think I can learn um, in general and from this room about just the, the like core teaching skills. Um, also, materials and equipment. I mentioned earlier, we, we are not a tech school. We do not have, uh, with the one exception, we do not have amazing equipment. And I spend as much as five hours a week fundraising, g going to old men's garages to dig out old tools, like all the things you can imagine. Um, also, a couple challenges oops, that are specific to our school. Our school is full inclusion, which means we don't track or separate students by ability. And um, while that's great, it also makes it very hard to personalize on projects like this. I have everything from um, semi-aggressive autistic students to would-be gate students in my class. And I have 32 14-year-olds. So that makes it um, very challenging. Um, personally, though, there is one struggle that is the biggest for me, and that is that uh, throughout my life, I have had a mentor in every success I've ever had, personally and professionally. <coughs> and right now, I have advisors, I have resources and things like that, but I don't have some, someone to really share experience with that I can learn from, and that um, as Gabriel was saying, it makes it kind of very lonely and it makes it a little harder to grow. Um, and then there are some things I'm already doing. You've read my application. I'm not going to hash over these too much. Some new ones are uh, I'm working with Make Magazine. I, I think I'm going to get to write an article and we've exhibited a little bit of Maker Fair. But it is my nature kind of to kind of take that for granted already and be looking forward and up. And I know everybody, when they look up, kind of sees something different in the clouds. But when I think about what this program could be, whether communally or individually, uh, there's a couple characteristics that I think are really important. And one is professional mentorship and training. Uh, this program needs to be about more than students. It has to be about teachers. And I think the only way to train teachers is through um, residencies, internships, where they're actually sharing a long-term, high-stakes experience with other teachers. And I think that's the only way we can really um, disseminate this program. Um, also, we don't need to start from the ground up. We can leverage existing infrastructure. I've already talked with uh, our director of credentialing and teacher preparation. I've talked with teacher preparation at UCSD, San Diego State. I've talked with the STEM collaboratory. They're all like, oh, yeah, we would love kind of some focus on how to help people. So we just need to leverage these things. We don't need to develop something from the ground up. Um, also, industry. I see a program, a place, where colleges and recruiters are frequent guests. They come in. They may be dabbling on their own things, they may be casually supporting students, or they may be there and we kind of are secretly trying to recruit them as teachers. But one of the most important things, and this is the last one, is I think we need to develop a brand. I've, I love this, but I, I really think it's sad that as a society, we have the marketing might to convince the world that you are a bad person if you don't have an apple and a Coca-Cola. Like, we can do that as a society, but we have so much difficulty really changing the public perception of education. And I, I think that's kind of sad. And um, it sounds like it's something that's being thought of. But I think that we could, informed by actual research we do over the next year, um, really develop a brand, both by our graduates and by just flat out marketing. And if, if we think about uh, these apprentices we could develop, these residents, if we do two residents a year for five years, and each of them is doing two residents a year for five years, this program can grow exponentially and very quickly. So um, I know I'm just one of many, though, so I'm going to digress a little bit. And 
we are, have all kind of climbed our own mountain, and we're going to be talking about those today. And I know this is what I see when I look at the clouds, but what I'm excited about now is I get to see what you think about when you look at the clouds.